But uh, it is great to be here with you, and I, I want to mention uh, t- the uh, tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, 2012. Uh, this whole, you know, the Mayan calendar, the world's supposed to end, and all that. But tomorrow, I'm going to speak about uh, how to get ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the the next event, of course, I think on God's calendar is the rapture. But then we get caught up to be with the Lord. We're going to appear before Him, and I want to. Uh, bring a very practical message, a very convicting message, but one we need to consider about how we get ready uh, for that day when we'll appear before the Lord. So we'll talk a lot about what the judgment seat of Christ is, and but then I've got 14 uh, kind of specific things that the Bible tells us we're going to be judged uh, for when we stand before the Lord, and so we'll look at those together tomorrow. Um, I've got uh, one of these top 10 lists. I keep some of these around, and uh, this is a top 10 list about uh, how the, the media will report the end of the world. Uh, Number 10 is the Wall Street Journal. It says, Dow Jones plummets as world ends. Uh, Number 9, Sports Illustrated uh, will say, game over on the cover. Uh, Rolling Stone, their cover will say, the Grateful Dead reunion tour. (laughs) Uh, Number 7, TV Guide will say, death and damnation, Nielsen ratings soar. Uh, Number six, this is my favorite one, Ladies Home Journal, their headline will be, uh, Lose 10 Pounds by Judgment Day with Our New Armageddon Diet. (laughs) Um, America Online, number five, will say, System Temporarily Down, Try Calling Back in 15 Minutes. Uh, Number four, Microsoft's website will say, If you didn't experience the rapture, download software patch, Rapture 777. Uh, Number three, the ABC Evening News will report the end of the world by saying uh, you might want to sleep in tomorrow. Uh, Number two, the New York Times, their cover will say world ends, details, page 33. And uh, my favorite one, this may be good for some of you up here in this part of the the country, the Chicago Tribune headline will say world ends, Cubs season looks bleak. (laughs) Well... Doesn't uh, take the end of the world for their season to look bleak, but anyway, if you're a Cubs fan. My wife, uh, from the time she was 12 to 18, lived in Chicago, and her dad's a diehard Cubs fan. He gets his heart broken every year. Well, I want to, uh, to talk with you tonight about 2012, 2012, the Bible, and the end of the world. Uh, some of you have probably heard about this whole 2012 end date, uh, December the 21st of 2012, when... Many say, you know, according to the Mayan calendar, the world's going to end or there's going to be some new beginning that's going to take place. And, you know, what's happening right now in our world is there's a lot of things that are kind of feeding into this. You look at this earthquake that's just happened and all these things going on in the world. I mean, a lot of people have this kind of sense anyway that, hey, you know, the world's going to end sometime soon. And so what's happened now is people have found a date out there and found this, you know, the Mayans and uh, this we'll talk about in a few moments how the, the, the planets are going to line up just right. And they're saying the world's going to end on December 21st, the winter solstice of the year 2012. There was a movie that came out about a year and a half ago called 2012. Uh, you can see there, I think on the top, it says we were warned. And if you saw it, it was the most expensive movie ever made up to that point. I think a few months later, Avatar passed it up. But, I mean, it was some incredible graphics. Uh, the one here over here on the right, that's uh, the USS uh, John F. Kennedy, the battleship. And right down there at the bottom is the White House. You know, this is a massive tsunami, you know, it's coming over. I mean, it was, a, it was a, a, the, the end of the world, you know, times ten. You know, just all kinds of disaster scenes. In fact, uh, Roland Emmerich, who made it, called it the mother of all uh, disaster films. There's the uh, you know, Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro falling down. There's scenes at the beginning of St. Peter's Basilica coming crashing down. I thought it was interesting, whenever the movie was made, uh, they asked uh, the Roland Emmerich why he didn't show any of the great symbols of Islam you know, come crashing down. And he said, I'm not crazy. You know, I'm not going to do that. And it's interesting, you know, they'll bash all these Christian symbols come down, but there's no way he was going to touch that. Uh, but it was basically just, uh, you know, uh, all-out uh, disaster and, and destruction. Uh, the movie promotion for 2012 said this, Never before has a date in history been so significant to so many cultures, so many religions, scientists, uh, and governments. And of course, it's picking up on this whole Mayan calendar idea. Um, there's a book uh, called uh, Apocalypse 2012 by Lawrence Joseph. And in the book, he said this, The 2012 deadline is the first time in modern history when so much is on the line for so many. The year 2012 has the mark of destiny uh, upon it. 
The New York Times a, a few years ago said this, the Mayan calendar is at the center of a cultural phenomenon. To some, 2012 will bring the end of time. To others, it carries the promise of a new beginning. To still others, 2012 provides an explanation for troubling new realities, environmental change, for example, that seem to be beyond the control of our technology and impervious to reason. Just in time for the final five-year countdown, the Mayan apocalypse uh, has come of age. So they were beginning here this uh, countdown uh, to 2012. Let me just give a few facts kind of to, to get our minds around, to kind of get us started. 60% of all Americans believe the world will end eventually. 20% of all Americans believe Christ, Christ will return in the current generation. That's amazing, isn't it? It's not Christians. 20% of all Americans. And 20% of all Americans say Earth's expiration date is within the next two decades. Now, I always stop and think about that because if one out of five people really believe the world's going to end in the next couple of decades, don't you think people would be living differently? You know, it's kind of like people have this thought, but it doesn't really change the way they live. And, you know, it's interesting. A lot of Christians really live the same way. You know, we kind of have this idea, yeah, Jesus could come back at any time. There's all these things happening in the world that seem to portend his coming. Yet it doesn't seem to really impact people's lives. To me, that's a, 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 re a really stark thing to consider. Um, here's another one, and this was back a few years ago, before all the hype began. 16% of Americans, that's about one out of uh, eight people, or one out of six people, uh, Americans believe some apocalyptic events will occur in 2012. Um, on the Ask an Astrobiologist uh, section of NASA's website, more than half of the inquiries on the most popular list were related to 2012. And the final thing is on 12 21 12 the winter solstice for the northern hemisphere, the sun and the earth will line up with the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And this rare galactic alignment occurs once every 26,000 years. Now, when I've given this pre presentation before, people will come up and say, well, I didn't think the earth was 26,000 years old, you know, if you believe in the young earth theory. Well, I'm just telling you what they say, okay? That's, I'm not making comments here tonight, and my purpose isn't to talk about the age of the earth, but that's what they say. Now, here's what's interesting about this, though. On, on, the, on December 21st of 2012, the sun and the, and the earth will line up with the center of the Milky Way galaxy, meaning the sun will temporarily block the energy from the center of the Milky Way to the earth. Now, that's why they say all this stuff, this cataclysm is going to happen. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, of course. I, I'll talk about this later. It's not going to be the end of the world, and it isn't going to be the second coming. You know, some things could happen, but it's not going to be this devastation uh, that they're talking about in the end of the world. But that's what makes this, this issue, I think, interesting is, you know, a lot of people are always setting dates out there for when the Lord's going to come back, when the world's going to end. But the reason this one is catching a lot of attention is there actually is something astronomically that's going to happen on that date. And then, as we're going to talk about in a moment, you have the Mayan calendar. You know, these ancient people who knew so much about the heavens, their calendar ends uh, on that day. So that's why I think this is going to really catch on. Plus just all the things happening in our world today that are leading people to believe that you know, the world's nearing its end. Um, Time Magazine had uh, one of its uh, recent editions, 2012, you know, the end. Um, the Sci-Fi Channel supposedly uh, in, in 2010 was going to have a six-hour miniseries. Now, I never saw that come to pass, but it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't maybe put it off till this year or maybe till, till even next year. Uh, the X-Files, supposedly the third X-Files movie is going to have a 2012 theme to it. Uh, there's all kinds of books out there about 2012. Sometimes if you go to a, a bookstore, one of the major bookstores, just go and look in the section on kind of new age or um, even, you know, stuff related to spiritualism or spirituality, you'll find uh, an entire shelf of books related to 2012 and the other events uh, with it. Here are some of the books that I, have in, that I read for this. Uh, Beyond 2012, you know, Catastrophe or Awakening. Uh, Whitley Stryber, you know, 2012, The War for Souls. Apocalypse 2012 by Lawrence Joseph. Uh, one of the main guys in it's John Major Jenkins, Maya uh, Cosmogenesis. Uh, 2012. Uh, there's one called 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. This guy, Din Daniel Pinchbeck, that wrote that book, he takes a lot of psychedelic drugs and stuff and goes around and visits these indigenous people groups all over the world. And I mean, he's a, he's a different breed of cat, but uh, he's into this whole 2012 deal. Um, another book here, The Mystery of 2012, is uh, 
a, a kind of a, an anthology by many different writers that are into all this stuff. Patrick Garrell, I mean, he's one of the guys, he's over in Belgium, and he's getting bunkers built over there and all kinds of stuff, uh, how to survive uh, 2012. He's one of the more radical persons in this. Now, this is the best book on 2012 out there right now. Um, <laughs> It's the only one that deals with it really from a biblical perspective. But I wrote this book a, a few years ago as kind of a preemptive strike really against a lot of this because what I find with Christians is we tend to kind of be behind the curve sometimes. It's like when all the, the uh, Dan Brown and Da Vinci Code came out. All that stuff got out there and confused, and there's still people confused by a lot of that stuff. And then Christians kindly, kind of came along, you know, finally a year or two later and began to answer this. And I think we need to try, as these things come out there, to kind of issue preemptive strikes uh, against them. And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, how does this really relate to, to our lives now? We'll, we'll talk about that later. But I want to just tell you one story that's interesting about uh, a radio program I was on one day and uh, talking about all the stuff related to 2012 that we're going to talk about in a minute. And um, there was uh, a lady that called in uh, to, the, to this program, or actually she got my uh, email address and got my phone number, and she called me like ne the next day or something and told me she'd heard me on the radio talking about all this. And there was a, a day a week that she says that she uh, goes out, and she sounded you know, fairly elderly on the phone. She goes out to a local park where a lot of kids from the, the junior high and senior high gather after school. And she goes over there and witnesses to these kids and tells them about the Lord and hands out tracts, which I thought, man, what a, what a great ministry. But she said that she heard me on this one day. And just, she said, I never even normally listen to that channel. But I was going through the channel, and I heard you talking about this, and I thought it was fascinating. So she listened to the whole deal. And she said that was her day to go witness to these kids. So she got up and went out there. And as she got out there, she said all these kids were talking about 2012 and how the world was going to end. And she said she began to tell them, and they were just amazed. She said this old lady knew all this stuff about 2012, you know, how up to date she was and all this stuff. So she was able to answer these things they were saying from the Bible, and she was saying how it was one of the most productive times that she had there in a long time in sharing with these kids. So, you know, people in the culture hear about these things. They want to know about it. And I think we need to equip ourselves to be able to, you know, not know everything about this, but to know enough about it where God can use us as uh, ambassadors for him wherever we go um, in the world. Um, History Channel has all kinds of doomsday stuff on it. Um, not long ago, uh, the History Channel, I heard a guy call it the Hitler Channel. You know, they have so much on there about Hitler. Now people say, well, now it's the Nostradamus Channel, you know, but they love to have that stuff on there. People are interested in it. Uh, Decoding the Past, one of the programs was on there. Doomsday 2012, you know, the end of days. Um, this is uh, the History Channel had a video called Nostradamus 2012. Notice the, uh, the uh, little subtitle, hindsight is 2020, foresight is 2012. You know, a little play on words there. Of course, the sand, you know, running out of time there. Um, on your iPhone, you can actually get an app that counts down to 2012 if you have an iPhone. Um, it'll ca it counts down the years, days, hours, and minutes, and the seconds. So you can get an app on your iPhone and really keep up with uh, how close Doomsday is if you're, you're into that kind of thing. There's T-shirts online you can buy. I mean, there's, it, it's amazing all the, the things that have been spawned by this. Now, I don't know if you, you think about this or not, but doesn't this remind us of something else? Remember Y2K? This was uh, the cover of Time magazine, you know, the end of the world, Y2K, insanity, you know, apocalypse now, will computers melt down, will society, a guide to a millennial madness. Now, many, are, many people are calling December 21st of 2012 the Mayan Y2K, and they said that, you know, Y2K was just a, a little warm-up or a dress rehearsal for this deal that's coming. This is going to be uh, the real thing that's coming. I like this cartoon I ran across. The wife's down in the basement. She says, Andrew, it's 2 a.m. What are you doing up? And he says, I'm just unpacking for 2012. He's unpacking all of his survival kits from Y2K. And, of course, it says up there in the corner, 2012, uh, the end of the world again. Now, why do people point to 2012? What's so significant about this date? Well, if you read a lot of these books about it, they point to... Uh, the I Ching. Supposedly it's the oldest book in the world, some say. It's the Chinese Book of Changes. Now, I've read a lot about the I Ching, and I'm not very good at math, and I mean, I, it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. But a lot of these people say that this ancient Chinese book, you know, points to 2012. Um, they point to Mer the guy in the middle, that's Merlin the Magician. 
They say some of Merlin's writings point to 2012. Uh, this attractive lady here on the right is uh, Mother Shipton. She was uh, a clairvoyant, an alleged clairvoyant, who lived in England about the same time that Nostradamus was in France. Supposedly she made uh, a lot of prophecies that uh, relate to 2012. But one of the key ones, of course, is uh, Nostradamus uh, himself. It's said that he made prophecies uh, related to the end of the world um, in 2012. Now, I don't want to go into this in great detail, but there's a book called The Lost Book of Nostradamus, and it's uh, basically a picture book. And I've watched several programs on this and, and read one book related to it. And what they do is they take these pictures from the Lost Book of Nostradamus, and they'll tell you basically, I mean, all these pictures, they'll, they'll start out and say, you know, that the sun here, you know, means this or that, and then this thing means this, and this means that. And they, it all leads to, they'll say, these pictures point to 2012 being, being the end. Well, now I look at those pictures and think, well, but what if the sun means something different and this other thing means something different? You know, it's a house of cards. You know, if you pull one of their presuppositions out, the whole thing falls. But that's the way people build these things. But people will watch these programs on television, and they got this kind of music in the back playing and some smoke going up, and you think, man, that's amazing. You know, Nostradamus predicted them all this stuff. I'll go back up here to this. This uh, Nostradamus wrote in what were called quatrains, these little four-line statements. And here's uh, one of his quatrains. It says, The year 1999, seventh month, from the sky will come a great king of terror to bring back to life the great king of the Mongols before and after Mars to reign by good luck. You say, wow, man, that's pretty heavy stuff, you know, to read that. Well, you know, a lot of Nostradamus's prophecies, they're vague they're very general, and they could apply to all kinds of situations. But I like this one because most of them don't give a specific date or time, but this one does. 1999, the seventh month. That's July of 1999. Now, as far as I know, I was alive then. None of that stuff happened. So I know that this was a false prophecy. Now, some of his other ones, you know, who knows? I wasn't alive when they were allegedly fulfilled, but I know this one was false. Because I was alive in July of 1999. And if you're wrong once, according to the Bible, what does that mean? It means you don't speak for God. It means you're a false prophet. And you know, the prophecies in the Bible are not vague, nonspecific prophecies. I mean, think about the prophecy of Cyrus. Remember Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus the king? He's mentioned by name in Isaiah 44 and 45 twice. Two times his name is mentioned. And he's mentioned by Isaiah the prophet in about 700 B.C. And Cyrus probably isn't born until 580, 590 B.C. So we're talking at least 110, 120, maybe 130 years before he's born. He's mentioned by name. And here's the kicker. God not only mentions him by name, but God tells uh, Isaiah that Cyrus will be the one who will let the Jewish people go back to their land and rebuild their temple. And when Isaiah is writing in 700 B.C., the people haven't even been exiled and their temple hasn't been destroyed yet. The temple wasn't destroyed till 586 B.C. So not only does he name the man who's going to let the people go back, but he's also predicting that they're going to go into exile and that the temple is going to be destroyed. On and on we could go. I mean, the prophecies in the Bible are so specific. So we shouldn't put any confidence in someone like Nostradamus. Another thing these 2012 folks do is they look at Bible codes. You've probably heard of the book, The Bible Code by Michael Drosnan. Um, what they do with Bible codes is they take all the Hebrew letters of the Torah, of the first five books of the Old Testament, and they just make them a big matrix of letters. And then they do what's called equidistant letter sequencing, where you find a letter and then maybe you skip 10 letters and find another one and 10 letters and another one, and they make words that way. The skips can be up to 500 letters. And they can do it diagonally, I mean, all these different directions. Well, you can imagine, you can find all kinds of stuff doing that. And so in these Bible codes, they supposedly found, you know, about the, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, the death of Princess Diana, all kinds of things. But with Bible codes, what they do is they go find events after they've happened and then say these were in the Bible. But to me, it's kind of like Monday morning quarterbacking. I mean, what good does it mean to do to find out it was in some Bible code after it's already happened? You know, we already know that by then. Well, in uh, the Bible Code 2, and I understand the Bible Code 3 has just come out uh, by Drosnan, but supposedly in Bible Code 2, the, he finds the, the words in there encoded, 2012 Earth Annihilated. 
I mean, these, well, these, these 2012 people just jump all over this. The problem is in the original Bible code book, he said in 2006, probably that was going to be Armageddon, going to be the end of the world, the big nuclear holocaust. Well, it didn't happen. So again, we have a guy who's making another prediction after he's already been wrong one time. And, you know, the whole idea of these Bible codes, I'm not a fan of Bible codes. Um, to me, there's several problems with trying to find these things. One is Jesus and the apostles never told us to do that. We're never told in the Bible to look for codes. You couldn't do it until they had computers. So basically until 20 years ago, you couldn't even use this information. Secondly, it just kind of gives people this idea that there's all this hidden stuff in the Bible we need to find, whereas I think what we need to do is just read what the Bible says and take what it says on the surface. We have enough time trying to interpret the Bible and understand and do what it says on the surface without looking for a bunch of hidden stuff. The other thing is they've done the same thing with other books like Moby Dick and War and Peace and other long books. If you, if you make the skips long enough, you can find all kinds of stuff in there. So I don't think we ought to look at, at Bible codes to understand this. Now, since we're talking about these Mayan prophecies, who were the Mayans? Uh, the Mayans were a, a people that lived in Mesoamerica and Mexico and Central America. Uh, they flourished from, uh, oh, about 500 B.C. to around uh, 1500 A.D. They lasted for around uh, 1,000 years. But they mysteriously disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to the Mayans. There's no mass graves like there was a famine or disease. They just kind of disappeared, which kind of adds to the mystery um, of these people. But the Mayans were incredible people, though, when it came to observing the heavens. Um, they, without without uh, telescopes, without computers, without all the things that we have today, they were able to come up with such precise measurements of, of time and of the heavens that really have been unequaled until just recent times. Uh, they had many, many calendars but the one we want to talk about here for a moment is the Mayan long count calendar. And many believe this was an ancient doomsday clock. Now here's what they, how they divided time. They, they divided it into these times called baktuns. One of them was 144,000 days. Thirteen of them was one great cycle, which is 5,125 years. And five of these great cycles equaled one processional cycle. Now, this is where, and this kind of gets beyond my ability in math to figure things out, but every 25,625 years, the, the, as the earth turns on its axis, supposedly it wobbles a little bit. So as the earth is turning, it's wobbling just a little bit, and it wobbles one degree every 72 years. And for it to complete one of these wobble cycles takes 25,625 years. Now, they figured that out without computers, without telescopes. And I always tell people, if it was up to me, we wouldn't have the wheel yet. You know, and these people were able to, to somehow figure this out. And when you look at their, and this, this, by the way, is the calendar. This is this, uh, in fact, I'll go back up. You can see it. That, that's the, the disc. This is the long count calendar here. And you can see right here, look how grotesque looking that is. The gods they worship, we know that they were heavily influenced by, by uh, demons. I don't know if any of you saw that movie by Mel Gibson, Apocalypto. Uh, don't watch it on a full stomach, man. It's gory, but it's about the Mayans. And uh, it just shows the barbarism and how, how demonically oppressed they really were. But according to them, the, the, the last one of these cycles, these 5,125-year cycles, started on August 11th of 3,114 B.C. and will end on December 21st of 2012. And so that's where this whole idea, really, of this Mayan calendar comes from. So they call this the galactic code, if you will, or the master code, really, of all things. And again, there is going to be an alignment that's going to take place, and they evidently knew that. I mean, not long ago, they knew that the sun was going to be lined up with the earth in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which, again, though, one of the things that shows me is that there's a God who made everything. You got orderly everything is. I mean, you can predict this stuff thousands of years ahead of time. You know, the other day when the moon was real large, they said, well, that isn't going to happen again for 23 years. I mean, there's just such order in the universe that God placed in it uh, that these things uh, can be predicted. A couple other things I'll mention here, and we'll, we'll look at a few other issues. But uh, there's a book. There's only a few surviving books from the Mayans. And one of them is called the Dresden Codex. 
um, I like to call it the Jungle Book. Man, they found this thing. They actually found it in Spain or I think in Italy. It finally made its way there as it was captured and taken by Spanish conquistadors. But it's a 74-page book. And the last page of the book chronicles a, a worldwide deluge or flood. And so all these 2012 people say, well, look, these uh, people, the Mayans, are saying the world's going to end in this massive deluge, a huge flood, the world's going to be destroyed. Well, could it be that the Mayans are referring to a flood that already happened? I mean, it's fascinating to me. If you look at every indigenous people group that have writings all over the world, they, they have a flood story. Um, most people believe, I mentioned the I Ching earlier, but most scholars would believe the oldest book in the world is uh, the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, Gilgamesh was this man, he was two-thirds man, one-third God, and he was going around through the world. And finally he goes down to the underworld and he meets a guy named Utnapishtim. And Utnapishtim and his family were the only people that survived the worldwide flood. And Utnapishtim sends a, sends a dove out to go and it gets a branch and brings back him. It's just like the Noah story. This is a, a book that was, you know, a story that was written in probably three or 4,000 B.C., and, and all these cultures of the world, there's a story. There are people separated by thousands of miles and separated even now by oceans. There's these stories of, of this ancient flood. So I think the Dresden Codex refers not to a future flood, but to a past one. Uh, this is the uh, temple to Kukul Khan or Quetzalcoatl, the great plumed serpent god of the Mayans, which, you know, any time that the god you worship is a plumed serpent, that's not too good, is it? I mean, you know right then you're in bad shape. But fascinating, here these people are. What kind of God do they worship? A serpent God. It just shows how immersed they were um, in, in demonism. One, uh, just one fact here. If you look at, uh, and I've got some of this in the book that I've written, but all, every one of their mines, their cities, their houses, everything was built somehow pointing to something in the heavens. I mean, they knew more about the heavens. The, uh, this great pyramid here has uh, 91 steps on each side. And then the top step, the top platform, which equals, of course, taking all the steps on the side and the tops, 365 for the days of the year. I mean, everything was geometric. Everything was, was built for a certain purpose. And uh, I also think it's interesting, here in, in Central America, they're building these pyramids, these great towers to the sky. What did people build in Egypt? They built these pyramids. I think all of that ultimately goes back to the Tower of Babel, where all the people came from, trying to build this tower to the heavens, uh, shaking their fist in God's face. But uh, here in this uh, Kukul Khan at the, the, the uh, temple there, to me this is an incredible idea. On March the 21st of every year, the spring solstice, on this side of the uh, temple there, there's this big head down there that's the head of their plumed serpent god of Kukul Khan or Quetzalcoatl. And about 3 in the afternoon on March the 21st, and about 50,000 people gather down there every year to watch this. The sun hits the st that, that side of the stairs just perfectly, and the, a shadow comes down like a snake in a serpentine motion and comes down and just coalesces with the head of the serpent. So, I mean, they knew how to build this thing to be perfectly situated where on March the 21st of every year, this thing would hit just right and come down there. Now, one of the things that always makes me wonder is where did these people get their information from? And there's all, you know, people say, well, they got it from aliens. You know, that's one of the theories. Or some will say that they got it from the lost city of Atlantis, that all these records were taken from there when it was destroyed. By the way, I read an article in Newsweek just uh, yesterday, uh, Simon Winchester. He's a guy who studies disasters all over. He thinks they found the lost city of Atlantis um, right, off, right there on the coast. It's in a marshy area right on the coast of Spain. You know, Plato mentioned it in his writings. But anyway, that's, a, that's an aside if you want to look that up. But a lot of people think they got it from there, but I think they got their incredible information, a lot of it from, from demonic spirits. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that the power behind, de behind false idols and the false gods at Corinth were demons. It says you're, you're, you're worshiping at the table of demons. And so I think that whenever they were engaging in all this barbaric, bloodthirsty worship and the things they were and they were trafficking with demonic spirits. And I think these demonic spirits gave, demonic spirits gave them great insight. Because, you know, remember demons were, were unfallen angels at one time and uh, were there when God created the world, when He created the universe. So they know a lot of these secrets. And so I think that's where they probably get a lot of this incredible information. 
So what's supposed to happen now on, on 12, 21, 12? Let me give you a few of the 2012 theories. Uh, one is a pole shift. This is from the movie 2012. There's the, that's the Himalayas and the water's coming there. They say what's going to happen is the magnetic south and magnetic north are going to shift. Now, I don't, you know, I'm not a scientist, but that doesn't sound good to me. You know, if the south pole becomes the north and magnetically these things shift. Now, some claim it's happened in the past, actually, and, and all, but they, they claim this is going to happen. There's going to be devastation, these earthquakes. And that's why they say now, see, what we're seeing happening, they'll say, this is just a precursor. It's leading up to So Every disaster there is between now and 2012 is just going to feed their, their deal more and more. So they think there's going to be a global flood. Now, my question is, what about Genesis 9? Didn't God promise there's never going to be a flood again? Of course, these people don't believe the Bible, but uh, we know the world is not going to be destroyed uh, by global flood again. And if you've seen the movie 2012, there, there is a global flood, basically, in, in, in that movie. Um, another one I'll just mention quickly, the Planet X hypothesis. They say there's a tenth planet in our solar system, Planet X. And uh, this planet X is going to come and hit the earth. You know, it goes around about every uh, 3,600 years and gets close to the earth. And there's whole books written on it. There's a book right there. I mean, you, there's probably 10 books I found written on planet X. I haven't been able to find one credible scientist who gives any credence to this whatsoever. And yet people just, just lap this stuff up. Uh, they think, you know, the world's going to be destroyed by this planet X. Here's one of the things I think is interesting is... Uh, Back in the ancient uh, Sumerian writings, I mentioned them earlier, the Gilgamesh epic and all that, there was mention of a uh, planet called Nibiru. And they, they talked about, they believed Nibiru was going to come hit the earth someday. But here's what these 2012 followers do. Let me read back in uh, the book of Revelation, Revelation 8. When you, when you read books by these 2012 advocates, they actually use the Bible to prove their points. Like, uh, for instance, in... Uh, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 10 says, And the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. And they say, well, look, that sounds just exactly like this in the Biru, you know, that's going to come and hit the earth. What you'll find with these 2012 folks, though, that they do is they take passages from the Bible that we would say apply to the time of the tribulation, and they apply those to 2012. But then if you were to say, well, now, wait a minute, let's keep reading the book of Revelation, what it says about the Lamb and how Christ is going to come back. Oh, no, we don't believe all that. But they just want to take the parts out, you know, that they think kind of support their theory. So it's kind of a bad case of cherry picking, if you will. Also, solar flares, you've probably been hearing about this lately. Uh, 2011 to 2012 really will be an active year for solar flares. They go into 11-year cycles, these sunspot cycles, and they're saying it could be a very active year, and some things could happen in 2012, you know, some, some pretty significant things with these solar storms. Because back when the large solar storms, one hit in 1859, another one was in the late 1950s, we didn't have all the technology we have today. So it's possible this really could cause something. Now, I don't think these solar flares are related to 2012 or the end of the world. It just happens the sunspot cycle is hitting at this time, which again reinforces their idea. And if 2012, if some sunspot stuff happens, some solar flare interruptions happen with technology, again, it's just going to feed into their view and they're going to say, here, here it is. It's just what we told you. But I, I do mention this because this is a real uh, possibility that some things could happen. I don't think it's a, a cause for us to panic about it, but certainly some things could happen. Um, what a lot of these people say, though, about 2012 is they say it's not going to be the end of the world. It's going to be the dawning of a new golden age. It's going to be the age of Aquarius. Here's what they say about it. It's a shift in the collective consciousness. It's a new plane of existence. It's the dawn of a new golden age. It's a pole shift in our collective psyche. Man, that sounds uh, really exciting, doesn't it? The birth of our higher selves. You can see down here at the bottom, it's going to be like a, a global Woodstock or something, they think, where everybody is going to come to this higher uh, sense of themselves. Um, I like the, uh, the, the 2012, the movie trailer said this, no matter what you believe, one date will unite us all. So it's kind of like you know, this is going to bring everybody together in this great, uh, they, they call it harmonic convergence. We're all going to kind of come together and be on, get on the same wavelength uh, when this takes place. I like what the, the Sacramento Bee, this is a couple of years ago, had an article that said this. 
It will be the start of a new era. At sunrise, December 21st, 2012, Earth will align itself with the center of the galaxy for the first time in 26,000 years. This cosmic cross is considered the tree of life. This will open a channel for universal energy to flow through the earth, cleansing it at all who dwell upon it, raise, rising all to a higher level of vibration. This process has already begun. Perhaps the spirits of the ancient ones will lead us out of the darkness and into the light predicted uh, by the Mayans. You can see all, how new age this is. This is very new age uh, talk with 2012. Now, when you think about the whole idea of setting dates, you know, I got the old song up here, does anybody really know what time it is? You know, those songs, anybody really care? But people have always set dates, haven't they? I mean, 1000 AD was a big date. 1666, you can imagine, was a big date. 1844, remember William Miller set several dates for the end. The Jehovah's Witnesses have set all kinds of dates for the end of the world. Harold Camping set September the 6th of, 18, of 1994. You remember for an end date. And now he's got May 21st of 2011. Uh, if you all know that, Harold Camping has set that date for the end. Well, wh why would anybody listen to Harold Camping? He's already been wrong once. Again, if you look at the Bible, if someone's wrong once in predicting these things, the Bible says don't listen to them. But Camping has this large following. You probably remember uh, in 1988, Edgar Wisenat came out with 88 reasons why Christ is coming back in 1988. Of course, it didn't happen. Then he came out with 89 reasons why he's coming back in 1989. And uh, neither one of those books are selling too well today, by the way. But people can't resist the temptation uh, to set these dates. They love to do it. But we need to recognize from, from Scripture that God is the only one who can tell the future. In Isaiah chapter 41 and uh, verse 21, God says this, Present your case, the Lord says. Bring forward your strong argument. The king of Jacob says, Let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what is coming. Declare the things that are going to come afterward, that we may know that you are God. In other words, if you want me to follow some God, have that God predict things that are going to happen, and have them come to pass with 100% accuracy, 100% of the time, and I'll know that that's a true God. Now, anybody can make a, some predictions at the beginning of the year and have a couple of them come right. You know, it's the old saying that even a watch that doesn't work is right twice a day, right? Or, you know, you just throw some things against the wall and, and a few things will stick. But the Bible has a proven track record. Did you know there are, 500, there are about 1,000 prophecies in the Bible? Dr. Walford basically came up with that number. 500 of them have already been fulfilled. There are 500 yet to be fulfilled. I mean, think about the track record the Bible has. And yet people look at the Mayan calendar. They look at Nostradamus. They look at all this stuff. They have no track record whatsoever. It shows the sinfulness of the human heart, doesn't it? People are attracted to this new age, mystical, weird kind of stuff, yet they'll reject the, the, the word of God that has such a track record. In Isaiah 42, 9, it says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them uh, to you. Reminds me of a story I heard recently about a uh, man who went to visit a psychic. And he walked up to the door of the psychic, and there was a handwritten sign on it that said, uh, Closed due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it is with man, right? But with God, there are no unforeseen circumstances. God knows the future, and only God can tell us what's going to take place in the future, the beginning from the end. Now, let me give you six reasons to reject the 2012 Doomsday Theory, and you, you'd probably know a lot of these already, but the first one is the teaching of Jesus. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Of that day and that hour, no one knows the time, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, but the Father alone. During the time of his incarnation, at least, Jesus didn't even know of the time of his coming. So people who claim to know the time of Christ's coming or the time of the end are claiming to know something that Jesus didn't even know during his incarnation. It's the height of arrogance to, to, to say that. I always say that whenever anybody sets a date for the coming of the Lord or the end of the world, you can be sure that's not the day. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42 and 44, the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think that He will. 
Acts 1, for he went to heaven, Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. I mean, how much clearer can the Bible be? Yet people continue to do this. Another thing is the paganism of the Mayans and Nostradamus. Why would Christians, and there are actually some Christian ministries I've, I've seen recently that are coming out saying, well, maybe there is something to this with all these things converging and all this stuff happening. Maybe the Lord is going to come in, 20, in, in 2012. Why would we believe things from, from pagans like the Mayans and from men like Nostradamus who used occultic methods? Of, you know, Nostradamus would stare into pools of water and use all these different occultic methods to come up with his alleged prophecies. Why would we listen to them? Uh, number three, the Mayans knew a great deal about calendars and time, but they didn't know the future. As I mentioned earlier, their, their civilization just mysteriously disappeared. I mean, if they knew so much about the future, why couldn't they prevent their own demise? The Mayans also never say that 12, 21, 12 is the end of the world. Their calendar ends then, but this is something that people have come up uh, with. I like this cartoon here. Guy has two Mayans here, and he says, so how come it ends in 2012? And the guy says, I ran out of space on the rock. <laughs> Down at the bottom it says, you know, at last the mystery of the Mayan calendar is revealed. We don't know why it ended at that point of time, but people love to jump on the bandwagon of these kinds of things and and, uh, carry it much further than what's uh, alleged. Uh, The other thing is the the New Age background of this whole thing. Uh, The the whole background of this 2012 stuff is New Age. Colossians 2.8 in the New Living Translation says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and a high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. And that's what this is. It's empty philosophy. It's high-sounding nonsense. Now, here's another reason that we know the world will not end in 2012, or we also know that it won't be the second coming of Christ. I don't want to go into this in too much detail. A lot of you have probably seen the 70 weeks prophecy before. But you know, the 70 weeks prophecy is the only time prophecy in the Bible. You read the book of Revelation, there aren't any dates given in the book of Revelation. Or, you know, the only time period mentioned is uh, really the main ones are three and a half years, you know, time, times, and half a time, then the thousand years and the millennium. But there aren't any dates given, specific uh, uh, periods of time or, or specific uh, dates that certain events are going to happen. But the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel gives a prophecy. I call it the most amazing prophecy in all the Bible. Daniel prophesied that from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, March the 5th, 444 B.C., till the coming of Messiah the Prince would be 69 weeks of years. And if you go from March the 5th, 444 B.C., to March the 30th of A.D. 33, it is exactly, using the 360-year Jewish calendar, it is exactly 173,880 days to the day that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem. That's why when he comes in, he says, if you'd have even known this the time when I'm coming to you. And so when we celebrate uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus and we celebrate a Palm Sunday, We need to remember that one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible was fulfilled on that day, when to the very day Jesus Christ rode into the city of Jerusalem. But there's 70 of these weeks, and the 70 weeks are 70 weeks of years. And the 69 weeks were fulfilled with the coming of Jesus, but now uh, we're in this period of the, you know, the kind of a parenthesis, people call it, of the church age, and it's kind of an indetermined period, but at some point in time, according to Daniel 9, 27, the, the, the Antichrist, this false Messiah, is going to come. And he's going to make a firm covenant with the many in Israel for one week, one week of years, which is seven years. And that's where this final week of the 70th week is. Of course, it's divided into two parts in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. But the reason I bring this up is, Messiah is going to return, or Christ is going to return at the end of this seven-year period. And, of course, we believe in the pre-trib rapture, which means the church is going to have to be raptured, you know, over here right at the beginning or a little before this. Which, by the way, Tommy will probably say this tomorrow, but the rapture doesn't start the seven-year tribulation period. The rapture ends the church age. The event that starts the seven-year tribulation is the signing of the treaty between Antichrist and Israel. So the rapture could happen today, and there can be some gap of time. Um, it could be a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, till 
that treaty signed, but that's what starts this final seven years. But I can tell someone categorically the world will not end and Christ will not return in 2012 because if that were true, we would have had to have been raptured in 2005 at least, right? Or before. So we're still here. The 70th week of Daniel hadn't started yet. So Christ can't come back for his second coming in the year uh, 2012 and the world won't end at that time either. So we can say that categorically from the Bible. A sixth point here is the biblical teaching about the end of the world. The present world isn't destroyed until the end of Christ's thousand-year reign. So let me put this up here to kind of, again, the rapture is going to happen one of these days. And then I put a gap here. I don't, you know, there may not be that much of a gap, but I just put it to show there could be one. The rapture is going to happen. You have the seven-year tribulation. Then Christ comes at His second coming. Then you have the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennium. And it's then in Revelation 21, which says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first earth and the first heaven pass away. Now, whether you take that as the destruction of this earth or just the renovation of it or whatever, it's not going to happen until there. So when people say, man, the world's going to end in 2012, I say, man, we've got a long way to go to the end of the world. It's at least 1,007 years from now until you know, the world can end, when the Lord's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. By the way, over here, this destruction of the present heaven and world, if you read there in Revelation 20, it's one of the most sobering things in all the Bible, where it says, I saw, in chapter 20, verse 11, where it says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. And then it says, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And then it goes on to talk about how the great and the small, all, all, the, all the lost are brought before Christ to be judged. What it appears to me like is before he judges the, 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 the lost there, that he, all that's there is a great white throne, and earth and heaven flee away. God, God who in the beginning said, uh, uh, you know, let there be and created everything, is just going to speak the word, and it's all going to just disappear. All that's going to be left is this great white throne and him that sits upon it, and people are going to be then brought before him. So, I mean, you think about the sobering effect that's going to have on these people that are, you know, evolutionists and deny God and deny his existence. All it's going to see is a great white throne, and they're going to see everything disappear, and then God's going to make it all, I think, anew again, create a new heaven and a new earth. But, I mean, there is an end of the world in that sense, I think, that's coming. But it's a long time out there. So 2012 is what I call the eschatology of the new age. The New Age movement has an eschatology. Uh, when the 2012 movie came out, look at, the, look at the caption up there. Who will be left behind? That was on their, on their posters. Where do you think they got the idea about people being left behind? But see, in their, in their deal, being left behind is good, right? Because if you get left behind, that means you live through it all. But our view, getting left behind is a bad thing. It means you're left behind at the rapture. But it's this whole idea of kind of co-opting this Christian language. So here's, a, here's something I want to just show you between 2012 and the Bible, and then we'll look at some, a few practical points. Here's what the 2012 people say. Jose Arguez, who's the founder of this whole modern 2012 movement, he says one of these days some silver ships are going to come and take the unenlightened away. The unenlightened people that aren't ready are going to get taken away from the world in silver ships. What does the Bible say? True believers are going to be raptured to heaven. 2012 says, we're looking for destruction, man. The destruction's coming. The world's going to end. What are believers looking for? We're looking for Christ. We're not looking for destruction. 2012, the future time of great cataclysm, they call it the shift. The Bible says there's a future time of cataclysm called the tribulation. But you see the similarities here? They got people disappearing, destruction, a time of great cataclysm that's coming. Well, the Bible says that. They say global disaster strikes on 12 21 12. We would say global judgment occurs during a future seven year period. They say all this is going to be caused by galactic alignment. The Bible says it's caused by judgment of God on human sin. They would say it's the end of the Mayan calendar. We would say it's the end of the age on God's calendar. Um, they say that all this is going to be followed by a time of heightened global consciousness or harmonic, con harmonic convergence. In other words, a false utopia. The Bible says. It's going to be followed by Christ's second coming and a one-year, 1,000-year reign of peace on the earth, a true utopia. And for them, the ultimate goal is for man to reach a higher plane of consciousness, reach his higher self. In other words, man has to save himself, where the ultimate goal in the Bible is for God to be glorified and that God alone can save us. 
But you see how Satan has taken the biblical model and just kind of counterfeited it here all the way through, which is what he does. He comes and counterfeits and he imitates uh, the truth of God. Well, let me close by looking at uh, 10 things we need to know um, about this 2012 date. First of all, we need to remember uh, that God is in control. That's a, you know, and that's kind of a, a statement we make, and it sounds kind of trite sometimes. We just say it so often. But we really need to understand and remember that God has a plan for this world, and everything is happening on schedule according to God's plan. I love what one man said one time. He says, you know, uh, uh, God uh, never panics. There's never any panic in heaven. Uh, the Trinity never meets an emergency session. Uh, God has it all under control. And when I look at our world today and all that's happening in our world, I mean, none of us like seeing the devastation and the things happening in our world today. But as I look at our world today, things are unfolding exactly as we should expect them to be unfolding according to what the Bible says. Now, I'll tell you what would really scare me is if everything was unfolding in a world in a way that was totally inconsistent with the Bible. That's what would really scare me because then you'd have the sense that nobody's at the wheel. You know, we're in this bus going down a mountain road and there's nobody driving the bus. It's just out of control. But even though we don't understand everything and there's a lot of mystery, we know that according to Scripture, there's someone who's driving the bus down this mountain road and God's taking this world somewhere. We need to remember that, that he's in control. Secondly, the world will not end on 12 21 12. It can't. It's not going to end to the end of the millennial kingdom. Third, the book of Revelation contains no dates uh, for the events of the end times. We need to remember that. There aren't any dates there. People, anytime anybody sets a date for something, you can know right off they're wrong. Here's the fourth point. Jesus will not return to earth for his second coming on 12 21 12. Why? Because we know if his second coming was in December of 2012, we had to have been raptured by 2005, right? So the second coming can't be in 2012. Number five, we are living in the last days. And this is an important thing. I think sometimes we don't. Uh, grasp the last days in the Bible is this entire age. The whole time between the first and the second comings of Jesus is called the last days. In uh, Hebrews chapter one, it says you know God in in very in, in times past spoke to the prophets you know in in, in various methods and various ways, but it says in these last days He's spoken to us in His Son. So this whole age we live in right now is the last days. Now the question is, are we in the last days of the last days? Which it appears to me that we are. But these are the last days. And Christ could come at any time. Number six, some unusual things could happen on or near December 21st, 2012. Notice I have up here the 2012 elections. Think about that. One month before this doomsday date, is going to be the 2012 elections. And depending on who gets elected, we could all think it's doomsday um, at that time, right? But I'm not saying that, that some strange things may not happen. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a geologist. Look at these earthquakes that happened in Japan. A lot of things could happen. But what I'm saying is some strange things could happen, but it's not going to be the end of the world, and it's not going to be the second coming of Christ. But here's a, here's a very important thing to remember. The rapture could happen in 2012, right? Because the rapture could happen at any time. It could happen in 2011, 2012, 2013, any time. And wouldn't it be interesting if when all these people are expecting all this stuff to happen, if the rapture happened in 2012? Man, it'd feed right in. It would be a natural explanation for people, right? You know, Jose Arguez could say, man, I told you the unenlightened were going to be taken away in these silver ships. You know, we told you that all this was going to take place. And, you know, the world's going to come up with some explanation for what's taken place. So, I, you know, I don't know whether the rapture will happen that year or not, but it could. Number eight, don't get caught up in the speculation about some great cosmic purification or universal expansion of consciousness. The problem with this new age idea that there's going to be this rebirth of man and we're all going to come into harmonic convergence, they don't understand the depravity and the sinfulness of man. The only thing that can change a person's heart is salvation through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something outside of us that takes place in the universe or some galactic alignment. It takes a change of heart. Number nine is make sure you've trusted in Christ as your Savior from sin. That's the most important thing. 
And in a gathering even like this tonight, I mean, I know that most people that are going to come out on Friday night to listen to somebody like me probably know the Lord. But I don't know all of you. And I know that any time there's a gathering of any size at all, there's a, a likelihood that someone doesn't know Christ as their Savior. And so I want to urge you tonight, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, that's what you need to do. Uh, the Bible says when He died on the cross that He purchased a pardon for you from your sins. You come to Him and recognize you're a sinner. You need a Savior. You come and you take Him and you accept that free pardon that He purchased for you um, at the cross. I ran across a story the other day. I want to share this with you. Um, you may have heard this uh, here, but it just came out recently. I, uh, I love to read things about Billy Graham. Uh, you know, Billy Graham's not perfect. He's made some mistakes in his life, uh, certainly. And, um, but I love Billy Graham because when I was five years old, I uh, heard him on television. And I went in my bedroom on, uh, back in June of 1965 and accepted Christ as my Savior. And uh, so he's always held a special place in my heart. And someone sent me this the other day. It said, in January 2009, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina, invited their favorite son, Billy Graham, at age 91 to a luncheon in his honor. Billy initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he struggles with Parkinson's disease. The Charlotte leaders, they said, we don't expect a major address. Just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After wonderful things were said about him, Billy Graham stepped to the roster and he looked at the crowd and he said, I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein the great physicist who this month has been honored by Time Magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle, punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his vest pocket, but he couldn't find his ticket. So he reached in his trouser pockets, and it wasn't there. He looked in his briefcase, but he couldn't find it. Then he looked in the seat beside him, and he still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are, and I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. And as he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees looking under his seat for his ticket. He rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. Having said that, Billy Graham concluded with this. This is a great statement that Billy Graham made. He said, see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren are telling me I've gotten a little slovenly in my old age. I used to be a bit more fastidious. So I went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and for one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This suit is the suit in which I'll be buried. And he says, when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. And with that, he, he sat down. But that's a great story because, you know, the, the, the whole key to life for you and for me is we need to know who we are and we need to know where we're going. That's the most important thing in life. We need to make sure we've trusted Christ as our Savior. And then finally, don't panic or be drawn away to rash, impulsive actions by fanatics and survivalists who claim to know the exact date of the end of the world or, uh, or Christ's coming. There's a great passage, and I won't have time to look at it in much detail, but I'll just mention it. You might want to read this maybe even in this coming week in your time by yourself with the Lord. But in 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, now, I think when Peter's writing this, he doesn't know when the Lord's going to come. And it's, he's saying, look, the end of the all things is at hand. The Lord can come any time, therefore. And he tells us what to do. And notice he doesn't say here, go get your pajamas on and get to the nearest mountaintop, you know, wait for him to come. It's very practical advice. He says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. What he's saying there is keep your head clear. Uh, Keep your mind sober and your, your judgment sound to be devoted to a, 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 have a devoted prayer life. And he says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. He's saying above everything else, be fervent. And that word in the Greek means to stretch like every muscle in your body, to be fervent in your love for one another. So he's saying there, keep your, uh, keep your heart warm. And then he says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. He's saying there, keep your home open. I love that. He says, be hospitable without complaint. Because a lot of times, what do we do? We're hospitable and people come over and then they leave and we complain and gripe. Man, I had him over here, they messed up the house and got to clean it up and you know, all this work we got to do. He said, no, be hospitable, but do it without complaint. Reach out to people you don't know. 
And then in uh, verse 10, he says, As each one has received a special gift. It's talking about the spiritual gift God's given us, the divine enablement we have. Employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, if you have a speaking gift, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. Whoever serves, if you have a serving gift, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he's saying here, the end of all things is at hand. What do we do? He's saying here, well, what you need to do is you need to keep your head clear. Be sober and, and have a devoted prayer life. You need to keep your heart warm and love the people of God. You need to keep your home open and reach out to, to strangers and, and use it as a place of ministry. And you need to take whatever that special gift God has given to you and you need to use that gift and employ it to serve other people. That's as practical as you can get. That's what God's telling us to do in these times in which we live. And one final thing that I would say is, as we get near to these end dates and these, you know, like this uh, earthquake that happened, people talk about this stuff. I, I was in the place where I lift weights where I work out the other day. And this guy that I've met in there and talked to, he didn't know I was a pastor at the time. He's found out since then. But we were there working out and he goes, man, have you been watching the, uh, any of that hist- stuff on the History Channel recently? And I said, well, yeah, some of it. And he goes, man, what do you think about like all these birds dying and falling out of the sky and all this stuff going on in the world and whatever? And I thought, man, the Lord just teed that one up for me really good because this guy's not a believer. And I'd actually been praying for him. And uh, anyway, we got started talking about that. And he, he told me the other day that uh, he, he just lives right around the corner from our church. He, he's, he and his wife are going to come to the church and visit the church. And I shared the gospel with him. But when these things are happening, people have questions, don't they? People bring it up in the workplace, your extended family. And we need to use this kind of stuff that's going on in the world, or even this 2012 stuff that's out there. Use that as an opportunity or as a platform for sharing the gospel with people. Because people are they're, they're overtaken by this deception. Uh, there's a lot of fear out there today. People are shaken to the core about what's happening financially and, and all these other things that are going on. I mean, there's, there's upheaval of epic proportions in the world today. And people are looking for answers. And so you don't have to be an expert on the Mayan calendar in 2012 and Nostradamus, all that. Hopefully you know enough tonight, maybe when you leave here, to just have a little bit where you could converse with somebody. But use that as a springboard or use that as a, an opportunity then to share with them the truth um, about Jesus Christ. That's my burden, really, in sharing this information. It's not for all of us to become experts on the Mayan calendar or all this kind of stuff, but so that we'll understand our culture, know where people are. We can give people a good answer and converse with them about it, but then ultimately lead them to the truth of Jesus Christ. So I'll leave you, leave you with this one thought tonight as we close in prayer. The end of the world is coming, but praise God, so is Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we just look to you tonight now as uh, our great God, and Father, you are the, the Almighty. You are the one that holds everything within your hands. You have your hands on everything, according to the Scripture. So Father, we come and we place um, our lives and our future and all that we are and have, Father, every one of us here tonight, into your, your hands. And Father, we rest there. We know that you have a plan for each one of us. You have a plan for our families and you have a plan for our churches, and you have a plan for this world. So, Lord, we want to rest in that tonight. And Father, as there is uh, all the chaos in our world today and all the problems and the difficulties and the things around us that the world just kind of seems to be shaking under our feet, I pray that we'd look to you, Father. We'd look to that kingdom that you tell us in Hebrews chapter 12, the kingdom that cannot be shaken, Father, to which we look, that we will be part of someday. Father, help us in these times in which we live to be ambassadors for you. Father, people around us have questions. They have fears. They have concerns. Help us not to be callous or to turn a deaf ear to those things. But, Father, give us opportunities, I'd pray for tonight. Give each one of us here an opportunity sometime in this next week or two to, to share with someone who needs Christ. And, Father, I pray that with that opportunity, you would give us the boldness that we need. Father, we, we chicken out so easy easily, but we can be such cowards. But help us, Father, as you give us that opportunity to have the courage uh, to tell people about the wonderful Savior that we have and the salvation he's provided for us. 
Father, give us that heart, we pray, in these times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen.